Hi everyone, welcome to the Startup Club. Uh, today we'll be talking to Mr. Kumar Subramaniam, who has over 30 years of experience in banking, financial services, and technology. He has worked in various banks, such as the Bank of America, HDFC Bank, Standard Chartered, and IDBI Bank. Uh, uh, he has also started a very success. He, he's also a very successful entrepreneur. So, Mr. Kumar, to start off, could you tell us? a brief of where you studied and what your career path was sure so I, I i did my engineering i'm a mechanical engineer uh and i passed out in 1984 uh from an institute which is now called nit uh in a in a sleepy town called raudkila in orissa and then i did my post graduation uh, industrial engineering in mumbai uh in a place called niti uh, which is a Government of India Institute next to IIT, POI. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar, but right next to a very big lake in uh, Mumbai called Vihar, Vihar Lake, actually. So I passed out of that, and then uh, I, I joined a bank. I joined Bank of America uh, from campus uh, as a management trainee, uh, worked in Chennai and uh, Mumbai, and was part of a team that helped set up uh, the entire non-resident business uh, that was the first time when India saw value in, in non-resident Indians. And they went after them to get foreign currency deposits, bring that into the country, and uh, uh, help, uh, help the uh, economy. So that, that, I, I was doing that for, for almost like six years. Uh, in '92, I went overseas. I went to Dubai, and I joined uh, Standard Chartered Bank, and, uh, uh, and I helped start the retail bank, the consumer bank, for Standard Chartered, where we were essentially focusing on individual customers, uh, looking to give loans, looking to get deposits, and uh, uh, that kind of business. Uh, I, I was uh, running the region for operations for, uh, I think, four countries uh, based out uh, in, in Dubai. Yeah. And I helped launch uh, credit cards uh, for them uh, way back in 1995, at which point in time I came back to India so I became part of the founding team that started uh, uh, HDFC Bank uh, uh, in India. Uh, and uh, I, was, I was probably one of the first employees that started the retail bank. Uh, all the branches that you see in HDFC Bank, there's one right outside your yeah, Kodi uh, school. Uh, so I created and helped put together the first 300 branches of HDFC Bank across the country. Uh, I also... Uh, set up their uh, operations, put in place the technology. I started uh, uh, the loan programs for HDFC Bank. I started personal loans for them. I started auto loans for them. Uh, uh, so I had a very interesting journey uh, with them. And then in 1999, a uh, very interesting thing happened uh, uh, in Asia. So, uh, Standard Chartered Bank bought a bank called Grinless Bank. You know, you, uh, many of you may not have heard of this name, ANZ, Grinless Bank. Uh, but that, that used to be a large bank in India. It, uh, it is actually an Australian and New Zealand bank, but spread across Asia. And Standard Chartered Bank bought out uh, many branches in multiple countries. Uh, so Standard Chartered Bank hired me back, and I ran uh, merging these two banks for about eight countries uh, out of Dubai. So I was very lucky that you know I had the uh, good fortune of starting a bank and a good fortune of actually making two banks merge together you know and that kind of experience is very uh, very difficult to come by because not too many banks start every day not too many banks look to buy another bank every day so i was very very lucky to have had that uh, kind of experience uh, in 2001 i came back to india and i became part of a turnaround team that looked at idbi bank which was that time a private sector bank and in 2003 I decided to turn to be an entrepreneur. And the reason why I turned, decided to turn an entrepreneur is because there's a big change that is happening in India. A lot of companies that are based in US were looking to actually outsource, move their work from US to India because India was a, a, a lower cost, uh, 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 a lower cost uh, destination. Uh, people could perform jobs at lower cost in India because salary levels in India were much lower compared to the United States. Uh, so a lot of banks, a lot of companies looked at India as a cheap destination to push out work. So a lot of people in the U.S. actually lost their jobs. 
and a lot of new jobs were getting created in India, especially on IT, uh, on back office processing, on contact center, and that kind of work. And, and given my experience, I thought there was a huge opportunity to go uh, set up a, a new company. And, and I stepped out uh, and I raised uh, money because I didn't have money to actually get started. Uh, and, and you need a lot of capital for the kind of business that I was looking to do. Uh, and, I, and I reached out to the uh, uh, what is known as the venture capital world because there are people out there who help people who've got interesting ideas. They're willing to support them with money for a stake in the company. And I, I, I went out and uh, uh, raised some money. I raised actually $10 million uh, of capital. And all that I owned uh, was actually one laptop, uh, one Excel sheet, which had a business plan. Uh, and and uh, me saying, hey, I'm free, uh, available to work. Uh, uh, luckily, people believed in me and, and gave me that kind of money. I went and bought a big building in Thane. Thane is in the outskirts of Bombay, uh, which had uh, space for about... Um, a thousand seats, you know, thousand people could work in one shift. Uh, I, I, I put up that building and I, and I went to the U.S. looking at investment banks. And the reason why I looked at investment banks is the best paying banking job in the world. You know, once you people come out, you realize the best paying banking job in the world is the investment bank. They pay serious money. If you, if you do a, an MBA in the U.S. and you get hired by an investment bank, your starting salary would probably be 200 to about $250,000. Okay, that's the kind of money that you get in the US for, a, for investment bank. But if you come out of uh, IIM Ahmedabad, let's say, okay, and, and, and you have the, you're equally bright, you're also studying in the same kind of uh, you know, education, uh, you join a bank in India, you'll probably get a starting salary of, I don't know, maybe 20 lakhs or 25 lakhs. Yeah, the big difference between 250,000 and, and 25 lakhs. And I thought, hey, you know what? Why don't I train MBA students in India on investment banking in the U.S., make them proficient, and let them support the banks in the U.S. offshore sitting in India? And I went and sold that idea first to a very large bank in the U.S. Uh, that's known as Credit Suisse Bank. It still, it still exists. It's um, a, a bank out of Switzerland but they have very large presence in the US. And uh, I created 200 financial analysts uh, in Mumbai uh, where I trained them and got them to support the bank. And that's how I kind of got started. Uh, then I got Goldman Sachs, uh, which is another large bank as a client. I got Lehman Brothers. Uh, uh, it's a very famous bank. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so so I, I had close to about probably about 4,000 people working for me. Uh, out of Mumbai, out of Chennai, and out of two places in the U.S., out of New York and out of Houston. Uh, I created two large offices there, hired a lot of people in the U.S., uh, and, uh, uh, and, and set up a fairly large company. Then in 2007, I actually bought a small bank, a very, very small bank uh, in, uh, in Texas. It's a, it was a mortgage bank, and I bought that bank with the intent of saying, you know how people sell mortgages in India? You would have seen salespeople coming, direct sales agents coming to you. People are looking to buy, saying, sir, sir, please open a, a, a loan. And they get the documentation and they collect it. And then they take it to the bank, right? They do that in India. Uh, that DSA, what they call as a DSA, direct sales guy, he makes about 3,000 to 5,000 rupees for every loan that he packages well and goes and gives to the bank. I found that in the US, if you do that, you actually get $5,000 if you do that. So I hired these DSAs, these salespeople in India, who are very familiar with how to do mortgage and told them, you know what, come work for me, I'll give you $1,000. And $1,000 those days was 50,000 rupees, yeah? And they were getting about five or 6,000 rupees. I told, I'll pay you 10 times more. I will teach you American English. And then you can, over the phone, actually do the same activity what you do in India. And I created a very large loan origination system. And I was supporting banks like Citibank, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, about 15 different large banks. Uh, in 2008, I don't know, your parents will definitely remember, uh, there was a big financial meltdown uh, that happened in the world. You know, the stock market crashed. Banks went through a tough time. 
In fact, one of my largest clients, Lehman Brothers, uh, shut shop. And it was a 150-year-old bank. They suddenly, Monday morning, they put a board out saying, close for business, okay? And, and that's when I realized that things were not going uh, too well. In the meantime, I did two, two very interesting things. Uh, I, I went to Dubai and I created a, a joint venture uh, with a company called Dubai Holdings. That was uh, the ruler of Dubai, Sheikh Mohammed. Uh, his holding company is called Dubai Holding. And they were looking to start a new bank called Noor Bank. And I helped them set up that bank in terms of putting technology, putting in place people, uh, all of that. I did a joint venture with them. And then I did a joint venture in India with a very large group called Reliance Group. I'm sure you guys heard of Reliance, right? Reliance that time actually created a brand called Reliance Fresh. They were selling vegetables. I don't know how many of you remember. There used to be a lot of shops. There were almost 800, 900 shops that are set up across India at that time called Reliance Fresh setting vegetables. And I, I helped put in place the technology. I helped put in place a, a loyalty program. And then Reliance went and put a lot of gas stations across India, a lot of petrol stations. Even now, some of them are there. Many of them are closed. But at the time when they put it out, it was fairly big. It was uh, very nice. They used to have a, a restaurant attached. They used to have a place where you could take a bath and rest. And they used to be very nice uh, platforms. And I, I put in place the entire payment system. You know, the credit card that is swipe and you pay all that technology I put in place. And I created a loyalty program for truckers because they were largely selling diesel. They were not selling so much of petrol. So for them, the biggest customers were, uh, were the truck drivers. And they used to have loyalty points for truck drivers. If you used to fill up three times in a Reliance uh, petrol station, they used to give them free food and a bed to sleep. You know, they had that kind of very nice, uh, uh, very interesting uh, loyalty programs. I helped them set up set it up for them uh, many, many years ago. In 2010, I sold my company. Uh, I, I, I sold it because somebody gave me a, a reasonable price. In fact, prices were dropping uh, for companies like mine. Uh, Sutherland Global Services, uh, Infosys, Wipro, about seven companies gave me an offer. And I chose a company that uh, was willing to take on all the employees that, were, that was having with me and, that, and I made them sign up saying they'll not fire any of my employees. All of them can safely move over to the new buyer. And as part of the process, I also moved over. And uh, I became their uh, global head of banking uh, for Sutherland uh, post the sale. Uh, I relocated uh, actually to Dubai. Uh, Aditi came along with me and uh, she was in a school in Dubai and uh, uh, I think they didn't like it. So we kind of came back uh, uh, to, to India. Uh, a post which I've been kind of shuttling. I've been most of the time on a plane. Uh, uh, other than thanks to the lockdown, I'm out here. Now, given the lockdown, it got me thinking, saying, you know what? I should do something very different. I've done this too much. I've traveled around the world. I've seen a lot. What can I do as part of the new normal? And the new normal is, I think the world is going digital. People have got used to the idea of working from home. And if you take a look at India, I feel the next big thing that's going to happen in India is going to be rural India. You know, uh, the amount of mobile phones that have gotten into rural India, amount of smartphone purchase that have happened in rural India, all that has gone up significantly. And I saw an opportunity uh, in the financial services space that I'm very comfortable with, whereby I could help set up a new company. And, and that, was, uh, uh, that was an inspiration. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of a company called uh, policybazaar.com. Uh, you would have probably seen a lot of TV ads on policybazaar.com. You know, policybazaar.com is a, a website uh, that has relationship with multiple insurance companies at the back end, and they give a choice to consumers to choose a policy that they want to buy, and they sell that online. Policybazaar.com is today worth two billion, two billion dollars. Okay, that's the worth of the company. I saw that and I said, "Oh my God, look at this guy! He's gone and created this fantastic website, and then he has gone and created this uh, fabulous thing. He has no branches. He's got very few people. 
all that he did was put a pretty looking app. He has got connections with 20 different insurance companies at the back. And he has got a method whereby he says, hey, you know what? If you come to my website, you'll get the best offer because you can compare products side by side by side and you can choose the one that you want to buy. So I thought, okay, this guy has done it for urban India. He has done it for the educated people. He has done it for people who are, who are mobile friendly and, and such. Who has done this for rural India? Is there an opportunity to actually go and do the same? Can I build a billion dollar worth company looking at India? And I thought, okay, this is not India for me. This is now Bharat. So what can I do for Bharat? And that's where this whole idea of saying, of starting a company called Bhima Mandi came into my head. And I, you know, uh, with a bunch of friends, I deliberately chose this name Bhima Mandi because Bhima, I don't know how many of you speak Hindi, but Bhima is the Hindi word for insurance. And Mandi is the word for a marketplace. Uh, so the intent was I want to create an insurance marketplace that a farmer, that a villager, that somebody who's working in a village school, somebody who's uh, probably driving a bullock cart, you know, they can see and, and decide and look to choose offerings, which means it has to be in the local language. It can't be English, right? So it has to be Marathi, Gujarati, Bhojpuri, Hindi, Assamese, Tamil, Telugu. So I said, okay, let me go about and I'll create a website that has all these languages. Now, will they buy the same policies that a person staying in a city like Bombay buy? I felt no, they may not. So I need to design new products that are that will appeal to a villager to look to buy. So I created some new offerings. And as we speak, this is currently work in progress where I, I, I created insurance against dengue, insurance against malaria. You know, people in, in the villages die of dengue and malaria. You know, it, it doesn't happen in Kodi, but it happens, I can assure you elsewhere. I, I created insurance against floods. I created insurance against locust because there was a big locust invasion that happened in India uh, recently. Now farmers are aware of it. They want protection against it. I created cattle insurance. I created tra tractor insurance. I created snake bite insurance. So I created whole new products. And these are all low value products. You know, they cost 50 rupees, 100 rupees, very small value so that people can make an impulse purchase by saying, you know what? I think monsoons may not come this three months. I want protection against monsoon not coming as it is my crops not growing. So I want to buy insurance to cover for that. So we created a drought insurance for three months and cost 300 rupees. But if the monsoons really don't show up, then the guy could get actually, you know, one lakh rupees from the insurance company. So we created very, very interesting products. Uh, all these products are, are currently under development. We'll go live, I think, uh, uh, end of this year. Now, the thing is, you have to educate people, right? Insurance is not an easy thing. Even for many of you, you know, what is this insurance all about? It costs money to educate. So what I did, I went and created one more company, and that is also under formation as we speak. And I called that company as Bhima Patshala. Bhima Patshala is uh, insurance school. That's a literal translation of Patshala. Patshala is a village school. You know, they call the village school as Patshala. And in Bhima Patshala, I created it as an NGO, uh, a non-government entity, a not-for-profit entity, where I take money from companies and I look to educate villagers on financial literacy, teach them banking, teach them the benefits of opening a bank account, the benefits of saving money, the benefits of, of getting insurance for the children and for themselves and for their uh, li livestock and for the tractor and for the fields they own and stuff like that. So I, I, I have created companies in each and every state in India, uh, put a state chapter kind of a president uh, who kind of owns that piece and ensures that he trains people in the villages. We have mapped out 650,000 villages. You know how many villages are there in India? 650,000 villages. Yeah. Close to about 86, 
860 actually, 860 million people live in villages, okay? Much more than cities, yeah? So that target population is two times the people who live in cities. But the amount of insurance they buy today is one by thousandth of what a guy in the city buys. So imagine that opportunity. Why have people not bought in the past? Hey, hey, because they didn't even know it existed. It was lack of awareness, you know, which is why I thought doing this patshala and educating will create that awareness. And once awareness is created, then Bhima Mandi, which is the company that sells insurance, will come right behind and then will look to sell insurance. So, so that's my plan. I, I, I'm very keen to help our country and our, our rural people become prosperous. Uh, uh, you know, uh, all in support of what the government is now trying to say. You know, Modi is now saying Atmanirbhar Bharat, right? Uh, ideas to make it all self-sufficient. You know, it's easy to say it, but very difficult to sort of execute it. So what I'm trying to do is to save the farmers, help them increase, uh, protect them against risks that they today face. Ultimately, they are the ones who feed us. You know, we don't even think twice going to a shop and buying rice and dal. We just assume is there, you know, agya, hum log khana kha lete but we don't even give a thought as to what is the effort that goes behind that man who's looking to do it. You know, if there's a flood, he loses all the money. There's no one who comes and rescues. And, and I'm hoping that my little company would come to a rescue. Uh, and, and, and that, uh, that Sean is what I'm trying to do. Right. So thank you for describing your brief career for us. It's very inspiring that your new ventures are helping farmers out in India. So since you started Adventity and, and these NGOs, could you tell us a few of the challenges you faced uh, while starting these companies and NGOs and how did you overcome them? You know, I, I was very keen that whatever I do should have a social impact. So when I, when I started Adventity, I was lucky that I was able to offer employment to about 4,000 people. And many of them were fresh graduates out of college. <coughs> Some of them just BCom, BA, BSc, basic degrees. And, and in India, people with a very basic degree find it very difficult to actually get a job. You know, it's quite difficult. So, so I was able to provide employment to people and give them a reasonable work experience of having worked with a bank and that too with the international bank because I was serving, servicing banks in the US. So sitting in India, sitting in Bombay, sitting in Chennai, there were people who were actually working for Citibank or Bank of America and such and getting that kind of work experience. And then they could go out in the marketplace and join an ICICI bank or a Access bank or HDFC bank by saying, you know what? I got banking experience. I worked with a foreign bank. You know, and that kind of uh, kind of uh, help. So one of the biggest challenges that I faced was that <laughs> people come, get the experience, and and then they their parents tell you know what, don't work for a uh, a small private company. Uh, if HDFC Bank is giving you a job, why don't you go join HDFC Bank? Yeah, and 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 then people used to kind of quit and and move on. So my company kind of became like a a training company. People come learn the job and the moment they get what they think is a better job they used to kind of move on so the so one of the biggest challenges in i think the it industry and the bpo industry is managing attrition how do you retain your people you know how do you motivate them how do you make them uh, stay with you so what i did i moved a lot of my employees overseas i actually got them uh, green cards i i moved them uh, to the us i I, I gave them exposure uh, of foreign travel, something which is very difficult that rarely happens in an Indian bank. Uh, and, 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 I, and I did it as a reward for people uh, who were good performers. And that became a motivation for people to say, you know what, I can actually go and work in the US. And that became a motivation. And that's how I kind of overcame the challenge. Another very interesting thing that I did uh, was I thought, you know what, when people come to a city to work, they tend to be restless. 
So suppose you've got a job that pays you, let's say, 10,000 rupees, okay? If somebody offers you 11,000 and you're, let's say, in a city like Bombay, you start thinking, oh my God, 11,000? Then I can probably move from uh, Andheri to Bandra. I can take a PG there. You know, there's a better part of town. So I'll take the 11,000 job. And people just move. You know, there's no concept of uh, uh, loyalty. I mean, <laughs> who pays maximum? Hello, I'm there. And you kind of... Uh, show up uh, at, at that particular place. So I thought, you know what, why don't I actually go create a center in a small town or a village? People who are there in a small town or village are in the small town or village because they like being the small town or village, you know? So if I'm able to take a job to that small town or village, then people will be more loyal. So I actually did uh, create a, a center uh, in a place called Krishnagiri. I don't know how many of you know, Krishnagiri is in Tamil Nadu, uh, in a district, uh, it's a district. It is very close to Karnataka border, very close to Bangalore, actually. In Krishnagiri district, uh, with the help of the local administration, uh, I created 100 jobs for women, girls, who had studied till class 10. And then the parents didn't want them to go to college because for college, you had to go by bus to Hosur. And, and the parents were so conservative, they thought, oh my God, if you put these girls on a bus to Hosur, they'll probably find boyfriends and they'll probably run away. You know, so better keep them at home. Let's not even allow them to go out. Uh, so I kind of identified with the help of the district collector, girls who were dropped out of school after class 10 because the parents didn't let them to go out. And then in a government building, I, <coughs> I created jobs for them. And I got ICACI Bank. Uh, to support me, where I did some processing work for ICICI Bank, actually collections uh, work, uh, where these girls will sit and then call, hello, hello, sir, uh, you're not paid your credit card bill, can you please make your payment? You know, so a very simple process that they used to do that. And they used to do that in three different languages. You know, people in Krishnagiri district, they can speak Tamil, they can speak Telugu, and they can speak Kannada, because that district is right at the border, and, and it's interesting, huh? Small children can speak three languages. Yeah. So I saw that as a unique opportunity and, and uh, I, I created jobs for them, gave me great satisfaction. The then president of uh, India uh, actually came uh, and, uh, and inaugurated that particular uh, uh, session, uh, that center. Uh, so that, that was uh, something I'm very, very proud of, of having, uh, having done the same. Kalam, Dr. Kalam, I don't know how many of you heard of Dr. Abdul Kalam. Uh, Abdul Kalam was very keen that companies need to take jobs from cities and take it to uh, rural areas. He created this concept called PURA, uh, you know, taking urban jobs to, to rural areas. And he was very happy to hear I did something like that. He came down on his own. He just came down and said, I want to come and see it for myself. Uh, the moment he came, trust me, every politician in India showed up right after behind him, one after another. It was very, uh, very interesting, uh, but a very exciting thing that happened. Back to you, Sean. Right. So since you have so many years of experience being an entrepreneur, what skills do you think students should start developing right now being in school uh, in order to be successful in running a business in the future? You and know, also what, yeah. <laughs> you know, so very, you know, I studied engineering, okay? And then I did industrial engineering post-graduation, pretty much like an MBA program, but I took no finance courses. <coughs> I joined a bank. Don't ask me why the bank hired me. They hired me. They took a look at my face and said, okay, face worth hiring, hire the bugger. And I got hired. Yeah. And uh, I, I found myself in there and I said, oh my God, I did mechanical engineering. I was not keen on going to a factory. I thought, oh, terrible looking place. You know, this is not what I want to do with my life. Uh, and I did mechanical engineering because my dad was a mechanical engineer. So, you know, it, I, I wish I was born in your era where you guys can call the shots and tell dad, hey, dad and mom, this is what I want to do. Yeah. During my days, uh, dad used to say engineering college here, right there. Okay. Or a doctor, one of the two. Or else you're useless. Okay. That, that's option three, useless. So I picked option one, engineer. And that's how I, I, I turned out to be an engineer and and, and kind of, uh, found myself in the bank. And the reason why I joined a bank is of all the companies that came to the campus, 
the highest paying job was a bank. So I said, oh my God, that kind of money? I said, okay, I need to go give that interview and uh, hey, Presco, I found myself in there. And, and, and then 25 years later, <laughs> when I look back, it looks so funny, but that was reality. That's how it kind of uh, happened. So did all that stuff that I studied in engineering, did it work for me in a bank? The honest answer is no. I think what education brings to you is it helps develop your common sense. And I think as long as you got common sense and you got a sense for uh, uh, a sense for money, I, th I think uh, you've got to understand plus and minus <laughs> extremely well. You need to know uh, what will get in revenues. You need to know what will cost. And as long as you can manage the revenue and manage the cost, you can run a business uh, pretty well. Yeah. So there are a lot of successful people who are not very well educated, but they run some of the most successful businesses in the world. So, so I would say uh, uh, a lot of it is hard work. A lot of it is self-belief. You got to believe in what you think you want to do. Okay. And it needs to be from within. It should not be as if somebody telling you, you know what, uh, it is now fashionable to run a, a hair salon. Uh, that shouldn't be the driver. You got to say, you know what? I want to make sure that I build the world's best hat salon. Uh, and you probably then make it happen. Yeah. So a lot of self-belief. And it's also important to do a little bit of research. You know, just not good enough to have belief. So you got to do a little bit of research to make sure that that opportunity really exists. And that you can actually go and make a difference. So when you don't have money. And you go out to the world and say, someone give me money to get this business started. The kind of questions that they ask, they don't ask, you know, which college did you do your engineering from? What was your rank in the class? I know those are questions people don't ask. People actually validate your business idea because that's what he's putting money on. He's betting on that, right? So they want to see your commitment. How passionate are you about what you're thinking? So passion is important. How committed are you? Are you willing to do that for the next 10 years? Or is it the Baskin Robbins is, you know, this is the month of September. So flavor for September is, you know, hair salon. So uh, is it a flavor of the month uh, kind of story? So they test your conviction and they test how well do you know what you want to get into? Even if you don't know all of it, they'll be perfectly okay. As long as they think you have it in you to be persevering. I think also what is very important is when you start a company and you're starting with few others, I think all your co-founders who are part of that, they need to have the same dream as you, you know? So if the dream is 10 years from now, I want to sell my company for a billion dollars. You better make sure that all four of you or three of you tell the same thing. It shouldn't be a situation where somebody says, you know what? Uh, station It can't be, you know, halfway somebody just steps off and then, you know what? Thank you, friends. Uh, I was just looking to make a million dollars. Thanks. I made it. Bye bye. And, and the person disappears. So you got to make sure that when you select your team, there are people who are equally passionate and willing to walk that hard ride and walk that distance and stay together when things are tough. I think that's what people who look to fund and I fund a lot of uh, new startups because I made some money. You know, I must have funded at least 10 new startups in the last four years. And, and that's what I, I look at. To me, education, okay, important, but not that very important. Uh, commitment, very, very important. Passion, very, very important. Need to know the market, very important. And need to understand numbers, very important. Because end of the day, you've got to look to make money, right? So you need to understand that money. It's just plus minus, divide, that's it. I'm not talking about... Uh, even going to square root or algebra or trigonometry or anything uh, 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 that far. If you're if you're looking to be a uh, in 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 the scheme of uh, of, of doing a startup, uh, and every startup needs to have a USP. I think that's very important. People look for a USP. So the USP could be that you're making a social impact. The USP could be sustainability. Uh, the USP could be you're going to a market that nobody has gone before. Uh, the USP is that you're copying something that has happened in the US, uh, but you're doing it in India because nobody has done it in India. It could be anything. Yeah. 
but there needs to be a USP. Uh, I, I think that's very important. You also need to understand very clearly how much money you need because you can't have a great idea, have little money, run out of the money and then wonder where is it going to come from. So you've got to make sure that you have access to that kind of money. And fortunately now in India, there are so many startup accelerators, people are now willing to uh, help uh, people want to get started. IIT Madras has got an incubation center. People coming out of IIT wanting to uh, do a startup. Uh, they make pitches. Investors come there. Uh, they put money, give you seed money to get started. <laughs> so I think the whole idea of you guys doing a startup club, what you've done, I think is a fantastic idea because it kind of gives you the grounding principles of what you need to get started in a company. I think the ability to collaborate is so important. The ability to work as a team is so very important, you know, and the ability to meet milestones, whatever you commit to a person who's given you money, you better make sure that you deliver those or else in future, you will not be able to get more money. Yeah. So, so making commitments and then delivering on the commitments, all these are very important for, for people who are in the, uh, startup business. Yeah. And I, I personally, I want to encourage as many startups as I do. In fact, I would say about 70% of the money I earn, I put it in startups because I believe startups are the next best thing that's going to happen in India. That's the one that's going to create jobs. And today what we need in India is jobs. We, we, you know, thanks to whatever mindset that we are born with, many of us are born with the intent of saying, you know, I want a stable job. I want a stable life. You know, being part of a startup club will help inculcate that risk taking appetite. You should not have the fear of failure. Okay. Just get it off your head. Always think positive and say, you know what? I stepped out. I'm going to make this happen. Come hell or rain. Yeah. But the honest truth is nine out of 10 startups fail. But that doesn't matter. One great thing about startups is that you failed in a startup is actually a positive in your report card because the next investor will say, you know what? This guy will learn from his mistakes. He will not repeat it for me. So if you had a failed startup, doesn't mean that nobody will ever give you money again. In fact, people will probably come to you first and look to give you money because you have probably learned from your mistakes and you won't repeat it again. You get it. Yeah. So, you know, there are no, uh, what do you say, uh, pass or fail in a, in a startup. Uh, there are only learnings and, and it's a journey. So you keep learning and you keep getting to be better and better at it. Back to your shop. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think since you mentioned that you also invest in startups, I think yeah. one day you could invest in one of ours as well. Sure. So, you know, so yeah. I'll tell you, I'll tell you some interesting startups that I put money in. Okay. Just to, you know, keep this uh, entertaining. Uh, I invested in a startup uh, very similar like Swiggy. You know, you guys, I heard of Swiggy and Zomato, right? So I invested in a startup called I, I do Delhi. I D O D E L I. I do Delhi. If you Google, you'll find it. I do Delhi does what is known as hyper local delivery. So they got all the mobile guys. Uh, and during this pandemic, people were ordering vegetables and ordering uh, grocery items and people were never ordered in their lives were ordering, right? So there's a huge pickup. So this startup started in um, uh, Hyderabad uh, and then expanded to Vishakapatnam, then went to Guntur. I brought them to Chennai. They've gone to Coimbatore. They're setting up in Trichy. They've gone to Bangalore. So I, I and, and, and I helped them get business from uh, Amazon, from Big Basket, from Reliance, uh, from 1MG, from uh, uh, Pharma EC and, and uh, all, all the uh, uh, online uh, uh, delivery stores, uh, and, and today they got close to about, <coughs> about 400 riders and they'll probably scale to about a thousand. And my intent is to sort of scale this company with the founders and, uh, probably look to sell it off to a Swiggy or a Zomato and, and create an exit in two years. Yeah. So that's one, uh, very, very, uh, interesting startup, uh, that I put money in. There's another very interesting startup that I put money in. Uh, called Himagiri. It's actually a very, very interesting startup. You know what these guys did? If you take a look at India's agriculture space, there is very little technology that is there in agriculture. You know, whenever you, you guys drive up uh, to your school and I, I drive from Chennai when I go to 
uh, Cody, uh, you see fields, you see tractors, uh, you see a plow, sometimes you see bullock carts and this. that's it. Oh, you don't see any other technology that's out there. So this are one guy who came out of Stanford and another person who came out of IIT Delhi, they got together and they said, you know what? Today, a farmer in one acre makes about, about 30,000, 40,000 rupees when he grows rice or he grows uh, sugarcane or, or something. That's all that he makes. So they said, you know what? If we create a greenhouse, you know, essentially put a polythene kind of a, a layer on top of the land and you temperature control it inside, you can actually grow exotic vegetables, you know, like gherkin and lettuce and stuff like that. And, and they fetch a much better price in the market. So these guys, they're tied up with Pepsi. Uh, they're tied up with McDonald's. So the lettuce that you see on the burger, uh, you know, uh, they're tied up with Reliance Fresh. Uh, they're tied up with Big Basket. And they got farmers and told farmers, listen, you make 20,000 per acre. Here's what the deal is. I will guarantee you 40,000 bucks. Whether it rains, doesn't rain, you grow, you don't grow anything, I'll pay you 40,000. Two times of what you make. But anything I make over, that's mine. Okay? And they signed a legal agreement. Farmer's very happy. He's getting two times of what he actually makes. These guys converted into a greenhouse, grew capsicum and grew all kinds of, you know, vegetables. And they grew four or five vegetables in a year. Normally, when you go rice or something, you only grow two to twice a year at best. Yeah? They grew it about five times a year. And they had back end arrangements with uh, retail companies and they used to make close to about a lakh, lakh and a half per acre, you know, huge money. So they did that with 50 acres and then they were looking for money to help set up. So I, I, I helped uh, raise money. I put some money. I didn't put much. I put about 50 lakhs, uh, but I helped them raise 10 crores uh, to sort of expand it to uh, Haryana. They're now taking to Uttar Pradesh. I want to bring them to Tamil Nadu one day, but uh, they're, they're doing uh, pretty, pretty uh, uh, interesting, uh, interesting work. Uh, another very interesting company that I put money in, uh, you know, if you go to a large corporate building, either in Gurgaon or Bombay or whatever, and you enter a lift or in a hotel, I don't know how many of you have noticed, there is a small television screen inside the, uh, the lift, which has an advertisement going. How many of you have seen that, right? So this is this company, uh, which wanted to actually set up these TV screens inside uh, corporate buildings, inside restrooms of hotels, inside lifts, and, and, and stuff like that. And they want to become the largest, um, you know, kind of marketing company where they put this display out uh, in India. Uh, they're well on the way to do so. So I helped put them, uh, put some seed capital uh, in there, help them raise about $3 million. Uh, they signed up with about 100 buildings uh, in Gurgaon area. Uh, and they just moved to Bangalore with all the large IT shops, uh, IT buildings. They are putting that infrastructure uh, in place and, and, and doing advertisement. So completely diverse uh, kind of a field. Another very interesting company I put money in, and, and this was not in India, but in the UK, uh, is called Commonwealth Tea Company. You guys can Google it, Commonwealth Tea Company. And, and this was started by a friend of mine. And, you know, he felt... Britishers, they love tea. You know, they are the ones who actually came and, and put all those plantations in Kunur and Munar and, and uh, you know, and wherever British went uh, before independence, you know, they, they, uh, they created this Commonwealth nations, right? Uh, most of the Commonwealth nations essentially grow tea. Sri Lanka grows tea, India grows tea, uh, a lot of the Caribbean countries grow tea and wherever the Britishers went, they took tea with them. Uh, so this guy created this company saying Commonwealth Tea, and he's created exotic teas. And he sells it inside Harrods. Have you heard of a, a store called Harrods in London? So inside Harrods, he's actually got a stall. He's got this fancy uh, uh, Commonwealth Tea. It comes with a very fancy packaging. Uh, and he sells one tea bag for one pound. Okay, A tea bag in India costs one rupee. Huh? One rupee. Ek rupee ka mal, they say, you know, asi rupee pe bech ra. Huh? One eighty times. So you buy for one buck and sell for 80 bucks just by putting on fancy package on it and call it Commonwealth tea. And I don't want to say he's fooling the audience, but people want it. They say, oh my God, exotic tea, Darjeeling tea, 
oblong tea, oolong tea, white tea, black tea, green tea, and they're buying it. And he sells in a sleeve. Uh, very, I don't know how many of you have seen Nespro. Uh, Nes, Nes, Nespro. You know the sleeves of Nespro? Something like that. He sells it for 12 pounds. And, 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 and people buy that. Buy the bucket full. Don't tell me why. But they're doing it. And I'm very happy they're buying it. I can tell you that much. Yeah? So some yeah. examples of kind of... And, and, I, I, and I kind of put money in different, different companies. Whatever interests me. Yeah? Uh, largely because I'm a risk taker. I don't feel sad if somebody blows up the money. As long as they did a sincere effort and they didn't spend it drinking, I'm, I'm quite okay. Right. So okay, I think sir, I um, one question. So yeah. yeah. So um, one question. Uh, so like in this pandemic, do you think it was like a blessing or was it like a curse for businesses and entrepreneurs in general? And how do you think it, we will emerge out of this pandemic, like uh, in terms of how businesses will emerge out after COVID-19? You know, you should, for every uh, problem in the world, you should look at it as an opportunity. Yeah. So when this pandemic happened, the biggest issue was, you know, maintaining social distance, making sure that you don't come too close to anybody else. And if somebody falls sick, then who did that person come in contact with? You know, the whole contact tracing process. So in the company that I worked with, uh, Sutherland, which bought my company, actually I built out a new offering for them. And it's called Sutherland Safe Zone. So we went and created wristbands, okay? When you wear the wristband, it has technology that if you come close to somebody else wearing a wristband and you come within two meters, which is the WHO norm, it buzzes. So you know, oh, I'm too close and you can kind of move back, yeah? So I also created technology whereby if the guy comes to office, wherever he goes in office, if he, we put an app on his phone and he turns on the Bluetooth, the Bluetooth communicates with other phones and it communicates with the Bluetooth beacon and we can track where that person moves around the office. Let's say next day he calls and says, I'm sick, I'm not coming, I got COVID-19. We can actually look up and figure out who all did he meet, where did he sit so that we can sanitize and all the people that he met, we can tell them to isolate and, and do it. So we put out an offering, which is not even part of our standard offering, yeah? Overnight, we created this offering because we saw this as an opportunity. And we took it to all our clients and they all bought it. So, you know, while there may be a pandemic, there is opportunity. Look at all the online shops, you know, look at how Amazon businesses went up in the pandemic. Look at all the home delivery for food. People who never created restaurants but just had only a delivery-only model, they all started doing extremely well. Look at Big Bazaar. The growth that they had in the last five months was 80% of whatever they did for the last five years. Yeah. So consumer behaviors are changing and that is an opportunity out there. And I think that is how one should look at it. It is not as if we are all waiting for that wonderful day where somebody say pandemic over. Yeah. It's a new beginning. It's not going to happen. I think this is now the new normal. This is how it is. We just need to learn <laughs> to live with it. You know, that is a, there, there may be a vaccine. No one is giving a guarantee that the vaccine will work for all strains of the virus. You never know. So I think the pandemic has taught us a lesson. A, it has taught us that health is so important. You know, many of us tend to uh, ignore it. One big thing that has happened, if, it, if you guys follow the stock market, all the healthcare company stocks went up four times. Yeah, if you are a stock market player, you would have said, you know what, this is a fantastic time. I'm going to put, you know, $100 onto healthcare company. It would have been $400 by now. Happy. So you should always look at the positive side of it. Yeah, I agree with you. So uh, what advice would you give to students who want to start a business in the near future? You know, there's no, there's no right time. Okay, people ask me, you know, should I go get some work experience and then start? Most parents tend to give you that advice. Yeah. In fact, my mother told me when I started my company, my mother told me, listen, your father is retired 
and we've got totally, I don't know, some 8 lakh rupees in the bank. So don't take loan beyond 8 lakhs because we can't pay. Yeah. After that, you're on your own. This is it. And I'm sure your parents also give similar kind of advice. Don't spend more beyond this. Don't take that kind of risk. I think if you believe in what you want to do, just follow your passion blindly. Nine times out of 10, you'll come out of success. And the one time that is stumble and fall, nobody will fault you for it. Because you did what you believed in. I think, I think that's so, so very uh, 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 important for, uh, for all of you. And there's no right age to do a startup. Huh? I mean, there are so many stories of people who actually dropped out of school and, and, and created wonderful startups. Yeah. Uh, Bill Gates uh, dropped out. Uh, Mukesh Amani dropped out uh, from Stanford. I mean, there's so many people who dropped out and, 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 and they did well. I'm not telling all of you, please drop out. Please. Uh, I don't want your parents coming with a machine gun. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll probably disappear somewhere quickly. Uh, uh, but I'm saying that, hey, education is important because it gives you confidence. Okay. Uh, the good thing that I, I think good thing about Cody is at a young age, staying in a boarding school helps you to learn to be independent. I think that ability to be independent is important because you can't be looking back for someone to give you support. You're on your own. Yeah, it's a big bad world out there. You're on the own and, and you've got to figure out how to uh, uh, kind of make it uh, on your own. It, it makes you a, a man or a woman, I can tell you, from a boy or, or, or a girl or from a teen. Uh, for certain, uh, it will teach you how to uh, learn on your stand on your own feet. If you've got three employees, you become very responsible because you owe it to them. You got to make sure that their families are 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 uh, are, are, are are you know taken care of. You're paying them well. Uh, you got to make sure that you got money at the month end to pay their salaries. Uh, so it teaches you responsibility. I think uh, once you become an an uh, entrepreneur, so it. it it get, gives you the life skills that no school or college can ever provide. I can tell you that much. So it's good you guys are doing it. You know, if I were you, I would probably do a small startup, look to raise a little bit of money so that you know the experience of raising money. It will teach you the responsibility to treat capital as precious. And uh, you guys can make an impact. So I think one of the things you guys should probably do is think what you want to do probably do something in the social space uh, because it could be impactful when you guys leave the school the next batch can actually probably carry it on uh, you guys can continue to retain a small stake so that uh, you continue to have interest once you guys uh, start earning money you can probably put some capital into it so that you can help it grow and and you it could be a way whereby kis can give back to the Cody community you know so we can probably look at some businesses uh, that are in and around Cody that you think you guys can help. Uh, you know, but it could be as simple as probably, I don't know, <coughs> chocolates being made in Cody. You know, if branded and sold well, because I saw it in the tea story. Uh, and I, I then did it because I wanted to learn how can a one rupee tea be sold for one pound? You know, how do, how do you, how do you, and, and I've seen how much difference branding makes. Yeah. Today you buy a lint chocolate, you're willing to pay $10 for it. Uh, but in Cody, you're willing to buy a chocolate. We haggle with the guy and say, Nappa, kunyo, kunyo, kammi, panna. you know, you negotiate. Yeah. But you don't ha have an issue buying lint. So why can't Cody chocolates be branded like lint? You know, why can't we sell it uh, and, and create a marketplace for it? Why don't we go online with it? You know, when I mean, you can think of gazillion ideas sitting in Cody. Yeah? Help out the school. Yeah, I think with the startup club, that's what we mainly want to do now in the coming months with the club. So th as I think time is running out, uh, thank you to so much for your time, sir. I really appreciate your time and your advice to all of us today. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you for hosting me.